much like a, a trips and we're able to research because now we know hey let's look at what are the terms that these different review platforms or, or these different uh, education providers i should say are ranking for and in many ways it's the classic quintessential ones that we would think of when you search for a product or solution it's is this legitimate is this a uh, you know what is the cost of this provider what are the reviews you know customer testimonials these types of terms but suddenly we can start to see the gaps and this was the key part of our keyword research we were able to test multiple alternative education providers and we were able to see that many of them being so new to uh, you know even the world many of them started during the pandemic most of them had focused on the engineering side of their platform they focused on okay how can we build a education provider uh, platform that's going to be useful to students now that's not wrong of them that makes sense for their business model but where's the gap the gap is in their marketing they'd spent so much effort focusing on the engineering that suddenly we were able to swoop in and start owning certain terms that they hadn't even thought about yet maybe it was on their roadmap maybe it would have got done but this is again this idea of you know you always want to be nimble in seo to be able to capture opportunities as they arise so we were able to see hey suddenly people are going to be searching for online education alternatives people are going to be looking for uh mba uh without a degree these types of terms uh programs for entrepreneurs that was a big term that we really own the space on and so suddenly what you what you're able to start crafting is you're able to build your content not just around the keywords but keywords based on a particular persona that you know you are trying to attract and so now who's coming to us we know that these are people who are perhaps well-funded startups or maybe they're existing corporate employees who are trying to start their own venture so they're people who have money and they're people who are going to want solutions and services provided to them and now that suddenly makes our monetization angle very seamless we can start thinking about okay which affiliate partners are giving us the best payout and therefore the ones we want to tap into we can start thinking about doing our own products our own services because suddenly we know that people are congregating on our website for a specific reason and i think this is one of the key factors is that you know seo while it is a excellent strategy and there's a strategy that's near and dear to me it's not the end game you want to always keep that end game of like how am i building an actual business as part of this rather than am i just making some graphs go up and to the right because we can all do that right we can all mm -hmm. do all the different content plays and we can get traffic from almost anywhere and we can you know listen to a Neil Patel hack that maybe gets, you know, double our traffic, but from a region of the world that we're not even targeting. But the fact of the matter is, especially today, is that many people have realized that it's not just enough to have, you know, a million eyeballs or virality. It's about, can you understand a customer or a persona better than anyone else? And when you do that, that's when you start really building a solid business case for why you've even invested in SEO in the first place. Um, and so that was really important for us to really focus in on were we getting uh, vi visitors as well as personas who were self-identifying, who were telling us, hey, here are some attributes about me. You know, the only reason I can tell you is we had that solid mid-career audience member is because they told us they told us the titles that they were they signed up for some of our email newsletters they opted in for new courses and they're telling us hey i'm a product manager i'm a you know senior marketing manager these sort of mid-career titles so suddenly we're building uh evidence around them of okay this is their life stage this is their career we're building those attributes around them and therefore know further okay what more content do we need to provide them do we need to start uh providing 
uh, content around how to incorporate a company? Do we need to start providing uh, content around, you know, tax information, you know, all these other peripheries? Because at the end of the day, you want to be that source of information they continue to trust, right? That is really where the world of SEO has has landed right now and where I imagine it's going to continue to be because it's no longer can you just stuff a bunch of keywords. Um, really, you look at where Google's algorithm updates for the last couple of years have continued to evolve towards. It's is the user getting exactly the information they want? Are they spending a lot of time on your page? Are they clicking to other areas of your site? Like all of these different ranking factors all tell a very similar story, which is that a user needs to find your information much more valuable than the next person's. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Love it, love it. Uh, I'm interested about creating content. For example, uh, can you tell your specific techniques uh, to find responsible copywriters who can create high quality content? Because uh, you mentioned about your target audience. We understand. For, uh, let's imagine uh, we want to uh, start a new project and we understand our uh, buying persona. Uh, Uh, target audience, but how to create high quality content because uh, content is still the number one ranking factor. And uh, I often see when we masters hire just copywriters who don't understand the topic, they are chasing for money, you know, uh, for the cheapest price. It doesn't work today. It's better to cooperate with experts. Can you tell how to find responsible copywriter? Because uh, I see this issue all the time when uh, even big companies have no experience with writing content. Uh, they usually reply, you know, uh, I have no time with that. I need to develop and write products. But how to find people who can create this high quality content from your experience? Yeah, so I've got a couple of hacks for you that um, I hope your audience is really going to appreciate here because it is challenging. And especially I knew this going in, in my space, because as soon as you find someone who brands themselves as a B2B technology writer, suddenly the rates through the roof, like mm -hmm. hugely expensive. And so we knew going in that, look, Nano Globals is a completely new venture. It's like I mentioned, it's just me and a business partner. And both of us have day jobs that is providing us with our day-to-day -day income. So we both knew like, Yes, we want to pour money into this venture, but we don't have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of venture capital to put into it. So finding writers economically was really important. So there's two big strategies that we used here. The first is honestly where you have to find some of the most quirky individuals. Classic example, we had an engineer, software engineer, who had been... Um, doing it for a number of years. He had burnt himself out to all end. He was originally from America. He was living in Mexico City at the time, and he just started writing online because he was trying to figure his life out. So by all means, a very strange individual, uh, an individual that you wouldn't have necessarily taken for a writer, but we knew exactly, as you said, Anatoly, he's an expert. Like the fact mm -hmm. that this guy has done development work for 10 years but he's only just new into the writing game meant that we knew that his content in terms of the substance was going to be good. Uh, he just wasn't necessarily pricing himself at the level of a tech writer. I'm sure in a couple of years and hopefully based on the portfolio that he built with us, he'll probably start making pretty significant money writing. The other strategy is a little bit different. You're absolutely right that you, there are many writers who aren't experienced in the areas, and especially within technology, you, it, it's very hard to find many writers who are actually proficient in the area. And this is where my other hack comes in, where, like I mentioned at the start, recording yourself either with, your, you know, with a business partner or even you can do it just yourself talking to camera, a very simple Zoom setup. It doesn't have to be fancy and just taking the transcript of that and handing that off to a writer. Now, this was super easy because I knew, based on my own experience, different types of topics. I talked through how to find the best outsourcing partner. I found talked about how to set up your contracts, all of these areas that I knew implicitly. And then by recording a simple 30 to 60 minute video where I talk through a number of these questions in different ways, suddenly there is some source material. 
that the rider can work with. And that was one of the best hacks we had because suddenly you could take someone who was not charging a huge, you know, rate per per word because they weren't branding themselves as a tech writer but you could kind of turn them into a tech writer because you gave them a first party original source because as i'm sure you can appreciate if we just set them off to research the topic themselves one they might not even understand all the jargon and the language and that's going to be one way that the content's going to fall flat or two, they're going to do the classic thing that most SEO writers do where they just re-spin a bunch of the previous content that a bunch yeah. of other people have written and it doesn't make any sense. So by giving them that proprietary material from myself in a way that they could use that as the source material, and we were very explicit with our directions. We were like, we do not expect you to do research outside of this. We will provide all the information to you suddenly you were able to get really economical rates. You know, we were starting to sell, uh, we were starting to get content produced for us, you know, at $100, $150, $200 a pop. I can tell you if I outsourced that directly to a B2B tech writer, I could have been paying like thousands easily. Mm -hmm. Love it, love it. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I'm interested about uh, link building. Uh, what kind of link building techniques do you use to uh, increase authority for this uh, specific case? And uh, how to find the right link building campaigns? Because we have a bunch of techniques today, black hat SEO, white hat SEO. I usually don't recommend black hat uh, because uh, white hat works well. So why we need to consider this? Uh, can you tell more about your experience of finding the right uh, techniques and uh, how you can recommend others to find uh, good techniques? Yeah, so the the core here is something that, funnily enough, many people in the SEO world know of, but it is something that they conceptualize in the wrong way, and that is the press pitching platforms. This is help a reporter out, this is quoted, this is source bottle, there's a few others, but basically they all do the same thing, right? They pair journalists with experts, and I think what often happens is that when you're thinking about link building, they're often trying to do it on volume. Whereas the better strategy to approach it is try and get yourself in the most premier publications possible because that syndicates across a bunch of other publications. So suddenly the one piece that you got mentioned in or featured in turns into 30, 40, 50 links. So a classic example of this is, you know, I myself have, have prided being able to pitch a story to a particular journalist based on a theme that they are trying to write about. So a classic example of this was the virtual assistant industry. We knew that the virtual assistant industry would be beneficial to our domain because it's in the outsourcing world. Um, it obviously uh, involves doing business across jurisdictions, across countries, you know, multinationally. So it all fit the nano global's theme of the content we were trying to do. And so we ran a survey. We ran a survey of a bunch of different businesses and we were able to see how much were increasing their investment in virtual assistants at a time, this was uh, admittedly during the pandemic, so 2020, at a time when you know, businesses were worried. They were looking at their costs. And so through that, we were able to compile a study and more importantly, we're able to generate some data. Now that data was super valuable to journalists. And we were able to start saying, hey, we've got Business Insider featuring us. Uh, we've got uh, Entrepreneur featuring us. We've got all these other publications starting to feature that data because the journalist was already writing a piece. The journalist was already writing a piece about how the virtual assistant industry, assistant industry had grown. We, they just needed some data that supported that. And so that's where we came in and provided that. Another thing, so if, you've got, if you don't have data readily available, the other angle is to position yourself as an expert. So ironically enough, because I've been in multiple companies that have done very successfully, uh, in the outsourcing and software development space, and similarly starting this venture with NanoGlobals, 
both of those instances prove that I am an expert in my space. And so suddenly when you have journalists looking for those experts, you have bodies of social proof. Now, as you do that, you start building more and more links and more and more credibility. Now it is hard. I will tell you like the first feature I got in Forbes was a very hard one. Like I had to do a lot of effort to prove that I was legitimate enough to earn that. But once you start getting a few of them, then you can start using them in your pitches over and over again. So suddenly I'm able to point to, hey, first there was a Forbes feature. There's an entrepreneur feature. Here's me in Fast Company. Here's me in Business Insider. Now you can pair that with other areas. Here's me speaking on a podcast that's in the top 10 on Apple. Here's mm -hmm. me speaking at a Salesforce conference. When you pair all of that together, now you start getting, you know, that real hockey stick growth because suddenly, you know, people always like to reference those who are authoritative about their mm -hmm. industry. And that I think is the key to successful link building because you start to peripherate across where you are the go-to source as opposed to, like you mentioned, you know, you don't want to be going the black hat techniques, not only because they work less effectively, but they just put your whole business model at risk. It is much more profitable to focus on the white hat way and let that viral, those viral loops start to reinforce your domain. Love it, love it. Yeah, so valuable. Uh, and do you use uh, uh, like social proof that you have this authority by submitting the request on uh, help of reporters out? Yeah, so this is, I say there's sort of two angles that you want to do when you, when you pitch mm -hmm. to help a reporter out. If it's a new reporter that you've never spoken to before, try and find similar publications to their publication where you've already been mentioned, that works mm -hmm. really well because journalists really fall into a lot of groupthink and they get very jealous of other journalists mm -hmm. very quickly. And so because of that, if you can show, hey, you know, if I'm pitching TechCrunch, here's me where I was featured on the next web, you know, that suddenly makes that journalist sit up and take notice. The second tactic and the far more valuable tactic is if you've developed a good rapport with a journalist, that journalist who speaks about your industry, you want to keep on providing that journalist with as much information, as much data, because they will often just repeat and repeat and repeat because it makes it easier for them. The thing to remember, particularly within today's press ecosystem, is you have journalists, you know, journalistic press rooms that are a tenth of the size of what they used to be, yet they produce three times the amount of content. So if you know that to be true, you know that every single journalist is very strapped for time. And so the more you can help them deliver on the pieces they need with content that's interesting and valuable so they get their eyeballs, so their job is secure, you are going to get so many more mentions. I see this all the time when I put out my own requests to get uh, source, like expert sources for nanoglobals, and you wouldn't believe how many people still talk about themselves all the time, do it all about their own ego. It's like, look, I asked yeah. for some information or some data about this. If you provide that to me, I will quote you. If you don't, go away. As simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, love it. I, I often see uh, on social media, you know, when people uh, share on their profiles, I'm great, I'm a, a, a guru, an expert, you know, but uh, nobody cares. People want to uh, get value. So uh, it's better to submit information how you can help support others, how you can share value, lead them in the right direction uh, to simplify their lives. So yeah, I completely agree with that. It's interesting because I never thought to use the same approach with uh, help of reporters out. So yeah, interesting about that. Okay, uh, uh, can you tell about um, SEO uh, techniques that you use. Uh, 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 okay, we mentioned about link building, about creating content. What uh, other stuff have you done for this project to get high results? I mean, like technical optimization, user experience, 
anything. Yeah, I would say, ironically enough, I mean, technically wise, there's nothing, you know, surprising under the hood. It's all just mm -hmm. a standard WordPress backend, which I, I mean, you and I could talk for many hours about gripes with WordPress, but the fact of the matter is it is still, you know, you know, industry standard for a reason. Um, and then in terms of uh, like other creative things we do, realistically, a lot of what we're leaning into is video. And that, you know, makes a lot of sense when you think about it. I mean, this common repeated uh, quote is that YouTube is the second biggest search algorithm in the world. And we've seen that time and time again, when we can create content in a video format, uh, as well as a written format, all you're doing is you're just giving a different way for your audience to consume that content. And so it does two things really well for us. Um, and we're still very much in the early stages of it, but the initial experiments look really good. First of all, it gives that alternative. So that, you know, is an added bonus for, you know, people who perhaps don't like reading a hundred uh, or I should say a thousand or 1500 or 2000 word article. And the second benefit, obviously, which is more semantic to Google is that it increases your visitors time on page. And by increasing that time on page, again, you are showing Google, hey, what I have is valuable. It's interesting. It's therefore what people want to consume. So that's like, I guess you would say on the content side of it, really where I think the biggest focus for us is looking to develop those proprietary products because that is the next big stage of our evolution. You know, we've been very happy with the results we've got from partnering with other, uh, you know, affiliates in terms of, you know, selling, you know, different courses, uh, recommendations from different software tools and all the different peripheries to it. But the fact of the matter is, there is a reason why selling your own products and your own services is number one, because the margins you can get are just that much better. Um, you know, it's far better to sell your own product at $99 a pop as opposed to getting, you know, $10 from one affiliate sale. Um, and I think that is certainly what I encourage everyone to look when they're starting a venture based on SEO is like, where is this going to intersect with what your particular client or prospective client needs? Because I think too often people who are in the SEO world just constantly look at the graphs. They just constantly think about up and to the right. And that's all well and good. But as you and I both know, you can kind of game that, right? You can always kind of like find a new hack or find a new tactic and Yes, you'll be able to show to your boss, hey, look, I've got like thousands of more visitors a month. But where the rubber hits the road is can you actually prove that you're delivering enough value that it drives your visitor to an action? Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a monetary action straight away. Like you can send them into an email newsletter. That's another way that you're nurturing people. You can send them into a free course that you develop. Um, there are all these different other ways that you can capture that audience. But the way that I like to think about SEO is, you know, if I answer the initial query correctly, that will make a visitor come to me for the first time. But my immediate problem after they've come to me for the first time is how do I keep them staying with me? What else are they facing? What problems are they encountering in their business and their professional lives that have made them even seek out my content in the first place? And if I can always understand that, that puts me in an incredible position to build not only a business that is going to be sustainable, but more importantly, it is sustainable beyond just SEO. And that is, I think, really important is that while SEO can be a fantastic strategy to build an audience, you still want to be mindful that your business can be disrupted by anything at any one point. And too often I see other folks in the SEO world have focused so heavily on it, then suddenly one algorithm update, you know, completely yeah. destroys all their work. Yeah, I agree with that. So valuable. Uh, I have the question about uh, 
can you tell three things that all the masters need to avoid today because it's obsolete it doesn't work uh, it can uh, hurt even more you know penalize your website three things that uh, because you know um, uh, the reason why i'm asking about that because i see it you know <laughs> the masters uh, keep doing something that didn't work today can you tell three things that it's better to avoid so first thing is easy i still see people um doing keyword stuffing like over and over again mm -hmm. and it's like it doesn't work google is smarter than that please just like leave that to one side the second is the introduction the amount of mm -hmm. people who still write this long waffly answer at the start of their it's not necessary user doesn't care if i ask the question of oh, how to outsource software development if that's my query in google i do not want to read an article that says outsourcing software development is a very important area that <laughs> has pros and cons yeah. to it, blah 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 like no give me an answer right give me an answer and then the final thing i would say is being a little too cute with your graphics this i yeah. think is one of those areas that is not as focused upon but it is critical i've been through so many different website redesigns optimizations performance improvements and i've been told by many designers that oh well like if we do this animation or you know this is going to make people like really interested sure if you've got it perfectly down but mm -hmm. nine times out of ten I found that when you get too cute with your design, too cute with your animations, you often end up breaking your site. You spend way more time on development. And it often just means that that's the thing that makes your user go, oh, this doesn't look right. Like I'm going to head out. I can tell you if any of your uh, viewers right now, Anatoly, go to Nano Globals, you will see we ain't mm -hmm. pretty. Like it's a pretty basic bare bones clean website and yet as we've talked about today it does sixty thousand monthly visitors there is a reason for that you obviously don't want to be ugly with your design mm -hmm. but don't get too cute love it love it uh okay three uh mention three things that it's better to do you know uh that all the masters need to consider in their strategy so i think the three things Again, first one, very simple, content, 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 like just doing the best possible content and not what you think the best possible content is, not what Google thinks the best possible content is, but just really understanding, okay, what does a user who has asked this query, what do they want to know? And just give that information. Don't hide it behind a paywall. Don't hide it behind a course. Just give them the information because they'll find it somewhere else. You know, the internet is a vast place. If you don't give it to them, someone else will. The second thing is get really good about pitching to press. Don't mm -hmm. go too egotistical. Really understand that every journalist. And this is true even of the most unbiased of news sources. They all have an angle. Everyone has a narrative they're trying to push. So if you want your site to be successful, feed into those narratives. Because if you don't feed into those narratives, another expert will. And then finally, lean into video. Like everyone needs to be doing this right now. Like, and I get it. Video is a substantial lift from written content you know and i've been doing written content my entire career but even i understand that i've got to get better at video because that is where the opportunity lies you see it not just in the rise of short form video you see it even in longer form video essay people like consuming video content and yes is there still a place for written content of course but if you're not also doing video you're missing a huge portion of your audience Love it, love it. And I have the final question about the future of SEO. Can you predict 
forecast this future what kind of future uh, will be because you know uh, i get the questions from my audience do i need to consider seo it's too late you know if i start from scratch what uh, kind of results can i expect or metaverse probably will kill all seo what do you think about that yeah so i definitely do not think seo is dead by any means i mean again everything we've talked about today about nano globals i started that website in april of 2020 right mm -hmm. when everyone would have said oh you're starting it from scratch you're starting it with literally a domain ranking of zero traffic of zero and built it to 60k uh, in just a couple of short years so it clearly can still be done now is the space more saturated of course it is but there is still opportunity there is still opportunity now the thing that i always tell people is you want to look whether your business is one of two categories. If your business is entirely new, entirely new to the world and you know, never before seen, you probably don't want to invest in SEO because you're, the people are not necessarily going to be searching for what your solution is in any large volume. You need to educate people. However, if you're in the second category, your business is in an established industry. And the fact is, most of us are. Like there are very few people in this world that are in truly innovative spaces. Most people are in some level of existing space. And I have two big areas why I think this is going to still be important. One, people are still going to want information and they're still going to turn, you know, we still know that Google owns 90% of the search engine market, especially here in the United States. So that's not going away anytime soon. And the second area, funnily enough, is to do with these antitrust lawsuits. So if anyone, particularly those in America who have been following, is that you know, these big tech companies have been facing a number of you know, investigations by the government about whether they are too monopolistic, that funnily enough, should give you confidence. Because I know for the last couple of years, the fear has always been that Google is going to take more and more of the results. You know, we talk a lot about zero search, how more and more results are to Google properties rather than outside properties. Well, the easiest way for Google to prove that they are not a monopoly is to point to other expert sources. Those other expert sources could mm -hmm. be your expert source. So SEO is certainly not dead. There is still a place for it. You have to be a little clever. You have to be a little creative, but there is still room for uh, opportunity. Yeah, exactly. I agree with you. I think uh, it depends on the right strategy and implementation. If you uh, chase just generic strategies, uh, high volume keywords, it's hard to get results. But if you uh, don't try to overwhelm big websites, so yeah, it's better to outsmart them. Patrick, it's a big pleasure to get you on my show, to learn from you. Tell uh, how people can reach out to you, learn more about you, follow you. Yep. So you can either check out my website, nanoglobals.com, or you can connect with me on LinkedIn, linkedin.com slash IN slash Patrick James Ward. Okay, guys, you can find all these links in the description below. Listen to us on Apple, Google, Spotify. Thanks again for your time. A big pleasure. Always welcome back, you know, to share more value because I love it. My audience uh, loves even more than me. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's hard to predict, but uh, it's uh, always pleasure to learn from experts like you. Okay, guys, thanks for watching and listening to us.